Hey, Mom, can you get that for me? I'm really deep into this boss fight in Jet Force Gemini. Fine. Hello? Oh good, it's you. Glad I caught you. Don't ask how this phone call is even happening. So hey, you just started listening to the Insane Clown Posse, right? Um, are you kidding me? I love those guys. You know, everyone comes to the greatest show. I got Jekyll Brothers. I got Great Malenko. They're awesome. I know, right? So listen, I just got some really cool news I'm going to share with you. I think you're going to appreciate. <gasps> Let's do it for the content, Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's the shit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's the wet regret. Let's get it. Yeah. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get called to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? That's the wet regret. Let's get it. There's a special place in my heart for the Insane Clown Posse. Like a lot of people, I first came to know them in 1998 when they accompanied the oddities to the ring and performed their ludicrously catchy theme song. But that was only the beginning of what's become a very successful run for the Wicked Clowns. From a gig in ECW, to the WWF, to WCW, then to TNA, and even Ring of Honor in their early years, it's not hyperbole to say the ICP are broadly woven into the fabric of modern wrestling history. But all that pales in comparison to their greatest legacy in the business, JCW. Originally known as Juggalo Champion Shit Wrestling, JCW's been around since 99, featuring a mix of established names, young up-and-comers, talent from the worlds of deathmatch wrestling and Puroresu, and of course, ICP themselves and their friends. By 2007, JCW finally changed the middle word of their company to Championship and formed a relationship with Philly-based promotion Pro Wrestling Unplugged. The success of their cross-promotional feud led to more PWU talent working with the Insane Clown Posse. Which brings us to this, Slam TV. It's a web series that was produced during the Tempest release party tour in early 2007, then broadcast weekly on JCW's website later that year. According to JCW, this collection was the first wrestling DVD to be sold at Hot Topic. Take that, Young Bucks. These DVDs were personally sent to me by the Insane Clown Posse themselves because they wanted me to take a look and give my thoughts for the channel. Hey, player haters, have you been told by one of your favorite fans they're fans of you? Right, didn't think so. The first season of Slam TV ran for 15 episodes to help build to their inaugural Bloody Mania event, which happened at that year's Gathering of the Juggalos in Illinois. We'll cover that next week for our classic pay-per-view installment, but this week I'm going to look at season one of Slam TV. The wrestlers, the presentation, the production, and how well they built toward Bloody Mania. Thanks once again to Violent J and Shaggy Tudo for asking me to do this. Whoop whoop everyone, let's begin. Jericho! Well, I can already say my ears are bleeding at the first sound of this opening theme for the show. The guy from the band Motown Rage is only screaming one thing and it took me way too long to figure out what it was. Jericho! Jericho! Is he saying Juggalos? Juggalo or Jericho? Jericho! or shut it down, or Jellicle. Are these guys big Cats fans? Oh, tear it down. Yeah, I never would have guessed that. After all the screaming, each episode begins with a two-minute stand-up from Violent J and Shaggy, known respectively by their announcer names, 3D and Guido. And what better place to kick this shit off than crispy, creamy Cleveland, Ohio? Also, the dickhead himself, Zach Owen, will be speaking directly to you, me, and also us. They rattle off a lot of details in a single take with these stand-ups, which isn't always the easiest thing to do. The team changes up a bit now and then, first with luscious Johnny Stark, no relation to Gunter Stark. Luscious Johnny is played by Jamie Madrox of Twisted, who puts on a funny voice. He's alright, but the chemistry with he and Shaggy doesn't quite match up to the original duo. In a later episode, longtime JCW champion Corporal Robinson joins the booth, but his work on the role is pretty meh. For as long as it's been around, one of JCW's biggest selling points has been the Insane Clown Posse on commentary, which in this show is both the best and the worst thing about it. It's the best because of Jay and Shaggy's energy and their commitment to being as outrageous as possible. It's nonstop banter between the two, speaking in that sort of overdone, verbose style of announcing that comes from a bygone age, only here it's laced with profanity, wisecracks, insider terms, fourth wall breaking, and lots of roasting of the wrestlers. Wow, cheap heat 3D 
cheap heaterama. It don't get much cheaper than that, Guido. Pondo's entire head looks like the tip of a dead man's penis. I believe they're talking about Cheap J Strongbow. Jeez, what has it got to be here? 15, 16,000 juggalos. Mouthpiece. Ow! Once again, oh, it was so hard we showed it three fucking times. What the? What am I doing down there? Who the fuck told Pondo those powder blues go good with those skull boots? However, sometimes the energy on commentary is a double-edged sword. Jay and Shaggy can be very clever and quick-witted on the mic when they're not hammering home all the gay and ableist jokes, of which there are a lot. I know, I know, 2007 was a different time, people got away with it then and so on. But even in the context of the time, it can be jarring to hear it so much. Madman Pondo and Necro Butcher, for example, are often described as a gay couple going through a lover's tiff. And speaking of them, their match in episode two against Jimmy Jacobs and Josh Abercrombie features some of the biggest figurative and literal gay bashing I've ever seen in wrestling. Oh, and by the way, did you know this is the same year that Jacobs debuted Age of the Fall in ROH? Now there's a guy with range. But seriously, sometimes it can be too much. You know, F word this, R word that. It can take viewers from any time period out of it, and it puts ICP in a bit of a negative light. But hey, times change, and people do too. So, boys, do you have anything you'd like to say? Sorry? Oh, there we go. Water under the bridge. Thanks, guys. Every so often, the heels will try and get extra heat by getting in the clowns' faces, which then backfires as they're instantly embarrassed by J.R. Shaggy with no real chance for a comeback. Now, in most circumstances, I would cry foul over them burying the full-time wrestling talent. Then again, the heels always got right back up, even from a double stunner, so I guess we'd call it even. And the crowds did eat it up every time, so if it works, it works. So commentary is one thing, but what about the rest of the production? I mean, that can often make or break a wrestling show, and in this case, I think Slam TV delivered. I guess I shouldn't have been too shocked at the exceptional video and audio quality. Lord knows ICP can afford good hardware and they clearly put the money where it counted. The camera work is such that you never miss a second of the action, which is clear as day even in the darkest, dingiest venues. I did get distracted watching their Las Vegas episode, which featured a giant mirror on the wall opposite the hard cam. I kept thinking there was a different yet equally well attended show further down the room. There's some obvious editing in certain intros, most notably Trent Acid's, where it becomes a running gag, but besides that, everything feels relatively smooth. Each episode's got a couple of full matches with highlights of others peppered in. That did a good job of keeping the pace quick and keeping wrestlers relevant. And the promos have a unique aesthetic of their own, but what overzealous crew members waving that flashlight like that? It's too distracting. Tonight, Trent Acid, he's on the way. I'm helping. As the series continues, the show expands beyond the matches and backstage promos. There are more sketches and more green screen work, like the occasional mock press conference featuring Guido or a returning Jamie Madrox, this time sans face paint, as Tracy Smothers' manager. It's apparent that as the showrunners got more confident in their style, they were able to add a couple more wrinkles where they needed to, but it doesn't feel as though they're throwing out everything they've done before in the process. Now we take a closer look at the talent involved in this show, and you better get used to them because you'll see them a lot. The biggest and most frequently seen names include Trent Acid, Nozawa, Zach Gowan, The Human Tornado, and noted deathmatch wrestlers Madman Pondo, Necro Butcher, Too Tough Tony, and the champ Corporal Robinson. Then there's Tracy Smothers, who serves as the PWU Hardcore Champion and one of the biggest shit stirrers you'll see on this show. They don't have any respect for Luke Fez, for Dory Funk Jr., for Jack Briscoe, Terry Funk, guys like that. They don't respect what I've done. A bunch of white guys and white girls that want to be black. Treat it up like a bunch of damn Watching this, I can't help but see some similarities between Tracy's act and what often happens when a wrestler who's performed for a major company drops down and invades a smaller, hardcore promotion. Look no further than ECW's response to Jerry Lawler showing up, or even today when Matt Cardona simply exists in Game Changer Wrestling. No matter the era, outsider heat is generally a winning strategy. Aside from the occasional jobbers like C.J. O'Doyle and some rotating local talent, these are pretty much the only names who are a part of this tour. Speaking of O'Doyle, if I didn't know any better, I'd say they were trying to build him up as sort of a Mikey Whipwreck character. He lost every match he was in, but he was generating some of that great sympathetic crowd support with every appearance, including the one time where he seemed to forget his mask. Whoa! What? Wait a second! There's something different about this guy. I can't put my finger on a 3D, can you? What a handsome man! What a handsome man!
Each of the main characters had their own unique story arc. Zach Gallon was an insufferable prick at the start of the show who had no love for Juggalos, but eventually won the crowd over with his perseverance in matches, including against Pogo the Clown, who was repeatedly billed as seven feet tall, which means that if he's that tall, then so is Gowan. Zach then began teaming with the Human Tornado, and together they were known as the Pimp and Gimp Connection. Hey, I pop for it. Too Tough Tony, the man who always came to the ring double fisting his Bacardi Limon, spent all of season one undefeated, thanks in part to his badass finisher, the Meteorite. Now I have to say, setting your own fist on fire and punching another guy with it is a pretty fucking cool visual, but watching 15 consecutive weeks of him doing that kind of took the oomph out of it over time. It's fine when you're touring and doing it in front of different crowds every show, but when it's all aired on Slam TV week after week, it does lose some of its luster. That said, come on, who on TV right now is going to steal that move for 2022? Japanese star Nozawa was undoubtedly one of the biggest fan favorites on Slam TV, but an early losing streak was something that can only be fixed with the help of his friend, the Great Muda. It is I, your teacher, the Great Muda. Your win-loss record in JCW thus far fucking sucks. And no, that's not a joke. They actually got the great effing Muda, former Dark Carnival member himself, to perform in JCW. But Muda wasn't the only big name ICP pulled out of the hat. At their West Side War special in Long Beach, California, Tracy Smothers was pulled from the show and his match with Too Tough Tony and was replaced by Kamala. Never thought I'd see the Ugandan giant take a helicopter crash and the meteorite in a match, but JCW is the land where dreams come true, it seems. Watching Necro Butcher here and his on-again, off-again feud with Pondo makes me realize that he's a better straight-up wrestler than I ever gave him credit for, but that's not why he was brought into JCW, was he? When he and Pondo are involved in the match, you can bet there will be some blood involved and gnarly weapons at play. Some people like the deathmatch stuff in their wrestling, but me personally, it's not my thing. So all I'll say is that this part of the show is a matter of taste. I will add that my favorite thing about Pondo isn't his in-ring style or his incendiary promos, but the fact that the commentary team buries the hell out of his one big movie does every match. Oh, the flying fat guy! That Holy didn't shit. even look like it hurt. There was extra weak tonight. Because, oh, the that, flying fat Once again, didn't even elbow. look like it hurt. He only came off the second fucking rope. There goes the lazy man from the bar stool. Oh, listen. The Silencer. Then there's Trent Acid, undoubtedly the best pure heel in JCW as this twisted man of the cloth. While he wasn't above swearing at the live audience now and then, his backstage promos were very creepy and subdued. He's one of the clear stars of this production, and that much is made clear at West Side Wars. After a TV angle where he blinded Corporal Robinson with tainted holy water, he added insult to injury by cheating to win the JCW world title, which the commentary treated as a bigger heartbreak than Hulk Hogan turning heel in 96. The a hush, a stunned hush over the crowd. I know what to say. Fuck you, Trent Acid. That's what I have to say. There he goes, the new world champion. There he goes, out the curtain and straight to hell. Corp would regain the championship in a steel cage match one week later, though the two title changes aired about a month apart. As for Robinson, he'd go on to hold that title for three more years before losing it to Madman Pondo. I wonder if Pondo beat him with a silencer. That'd be poetic. With a wide variety of talent like this on display every week, the wrestling is kind of a mixed bag. The regular matches are fine, but nothing amazing, and some of the death matches have positive qualities, but those moments are few and far between for me. But it's all good for the packed crowds of bloodthirsty juggalo assassins we see every episode. I wish every crowd was as vocal as these ninjas around the country, including Reno in episode 7. I wonder if I know anybody who went to that show. But considering the setting and the show's raunchy nature, the fans were predictably rowdy. Crowd members were encouraged to throw fago, garbage, and even coins at the heels in the ring. And we're not even talking about the occasional fan run-in. Not exactly the best when it comes to the safety of the wrestlers or the fans. By the way, how mad do you have to be at someone to throw your pants at them. The final episode of season one is one big preview show for Bloody Mania, hosted by 3D and his collection of belts. It was a good way to wrap up all the big angles from the season and how it played into the big event. But why did the production wait until this point to get shoddy? Short time will tell as Bloody Mania is moments away. Too tough, Tony?
And that was season one of JCW's Slam TV. And folks, spray me down with some Fago because I am hot for Bloody Mania. The best way I can describe this era of Juggalo Championship Wrestling is it's the yin to the Urban Wrestling Federation's yang, and not just in terms of the racial makeup of the two leagues. Both feature a very specific combination of traditional wrestling and wild hardcore brawls with a hip hop twist. But while the UWF's action felt more fast paced and high risk, JCW's in ring work had more of an old school slant. While the UWF tried to be like The Wire, JCW trends more toward jackass. And hey, at least JCW gave a woman a speaking role. This first season of Slam TV had a lot of good things going for it. Good consistent production, a tight formula, and easy to follow storylines. The commentary by the Insane Clown Posse had some great and hilarious moments, but unfortunately, it's weighed down by language that does not really fly, and the boys have since regretted using. The repeated main events with the same four or five guys every week by the end got to be a bit much, and Too Tough Tony's win streak almost had me tired of seeing a flaming fist after a while. But overall, Slam TV's been a fun look at wrestling from the spooky carnival at the edge of town. These shows are not for the wrestling purist, but there should still be something to enjoy for juggalos and non-juggalos alike. And next week we see all this action come to a head when I review the first ever Bloody Mania event from the 2007 Gathering of the Juggalos by request from the insane clown posse themselves. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Welcome, Gator McCraw! Son?